楽しい楽しいWhat's up, guys? Aeon of Horus here, back with my Genesis Testament 4 review slash thoughts video. So I'll be dropping my thoughts on the new volume of Index, as it has just been fully translated by JS06, so massive kudos to him. Just before we start the video, I just want to mention that in the previous video I made about how magic works in Index, that I would make a, a similar video, what to do with science and esper powers how esper powers actually work at 3000 subscribers so if you can help me get to 3000 subscribers that'd be a massive help for the channel so please consider supporting the channel to help us grow further if you enjoy the index and railgun series with that out of the way i want to talk about the volume itself now and this volume was decent it wasn't the best volume of all time in index um, but it wasn't terrible either it was somewhere in the middle but overall, I really enjoyed the volume. This volume definitely felt like a build-up volume, one that is building up to a giant climax right at the end. So I'm looking forward to reading the climax of where this story is going. And once that is written, once we do have that climax, I think it will improve my opinion of this volume looking back in retrospect. So this volume had a mystery vibe, kind of similar to New Testament 16, where there was a massive heat wave going out through Academy City. But instead, we have the reverse of that in Los Angeles with a massive cold wave with temperatures of minus 30 degrees. Combined with the fact that the entire population of LA, around 30 million people, have gone completely missing. So Toma and Style and Kanzaki get sent to investigate and to attack R&C Occultics HQ they believe is behind the disappearances. I feel like the environmental changes in this volume were better handled than the ones in New Testament 16, since I feel like that volume was just an excuse to get all the characters in swimsuits, and this volume actually felt like actual tension and stakes in the story. I felt like the prologue was a perfect introduction for showing us how dangerous this new environment in LA can be by following an American civilian who falls victim to the mysterious disappearing magic. So yeah, Style and Kazaki make their return in this volume, and it's honestly great to have them back as their interactions with Toma are really interesting and fun. Uh, while Kanzaki does get taken out by the sand of magic early in the volume, uh, she still has a decent amount of screen time, which is good enough for her character and Style is definitely one of the best characters in this volume. As the volume progresses and the mystery unravels itself, it is revealed that a magician called Sushinitaz is defending the RNC Occultics HQ and is behind the disappearances in Los Angeles. Sushinitaz takes the form of Milzebeth Grocery, the company executive of Space Engage who has gone missing in Los Angeles, who actually made a partnership with RNC Occultics. A large portion of the volume is arguing if Melzebeth was actually a good person or not. Style arguing that she is a bad person who willingly cooperated with RNC Occultics, while Toma believes that she's a good person who was forced to. While it is enjoyable to see Style's cynical nature, I must admit it was kind of obvious that Toma would be proven right, in my opinion. Like, I don't think any of the clues pointed to Melzebeth being an actual bad person. Well, that's just my opinion. So I feel like the mystery was almost a bit too obvious at times in this volume. Our team of heroes also come across uh, the daughter of Melzebeth, Helkalia, and she has been taken hostage in the city as, of course, Melzebeth was a good person and she had to cooperate with uh, Anna Sprengel and RNC Occultics because she had to protect her daughter. And once she was no longer needed, she was turned into sand by the sand magic used by Suchinitas. From the cover, you may think Halkalia will have a big role in this volume, but to be honest, she's mostly in the background and doesn't really do or say much. Most of her dialogue goes through Terma's translator pen, which translates index in like a Google Translate way. While it was kind of amusing at first, it kind of ruins most of the dialogue used by some of the foreign characters in this volume. 
since the grammar isn't the best and some of the words don't make sense. But yeah, Helcalia didn't really have much motivation apart from doubting whether her mum was a good or bad person. That conflict was interesting at first, but it didn't really last very long to be honest, and she quickly just disappeared for the volume, like in the last section or chapter. So yeah, overall, Helcalia wasn't the greatest character by any stretch, so that part was definitely disappointing since she was seen to have been an important role, but she wasn't. And the main emotional drive of the volume is meant to be the relationship between Helcalia and Melzebeth, you know, the mother and daughter relationship. But we don't really see them interact until the end when they're reunited, so we can't really resonate that much emotionally with Helcalia, how she feels about her mother, since we've never seen them interact before. It's just, hey, here's a girl who we need to help out, who we feel sorry for, so let's do it. And put her mind at ease that her mother is not Satan. But why did RNC occultics need Melzebeth? It's because of a technology known as the Logistic Hornets. And I think these Logistic Hornets are pretty cool in design and function. So they're meant to take people into space, but they can also influence the environment around them, which is how the cold wave starts in Academy City. And these environmental conditions are also necessary for Citrinitas to use their magic. So it's a combination of both magic and science, which I find really interesting. And Kamachi does go into a lot of depth about how these two powers function together, which I really appreciated. We later find out the motivation for building the Logistic Hornets, which was to give Helcalia, the daughter who is very young, a wedding in space. And this was the father's idea who was deceased and Melzebeth decided to turn it into a reality. Now, I don't know if this was a wedding planned for the future, I think it may have been, but Still, it's kinda a weird motivation that I couldn't really get behind. I mean, to be fair, they are an Indian family, and arranged marriages and stuff like that are a thing. But yeah, at the same time, it's like, I can't really get behind that motivation at all. Uh, so that's definitely another minus for the characters in this volume. So yeah, the main problem I have this volume is that the all the new characters that were introduced weren't likeable, really. I mean, that wasn't the case in Genesis Testament 3, since literally majority of the cast that were introduced were likeable in some way or form. But it's the opposite of this volume, like almost none of them were anything special or likeable in my opinion, which is a shame. But at least the old characters definitely stood out. One interesting thing about this volume was that there were three, like, sub-stories going on concurrently with the main story we had in Los Angeles. So we had Roberto Katze in Washington DC, then we had the worldwide commotion with the sisters, the Misaka clones, which did tie in with Roberto Katze as well, and also Accelerator's Trial. In fact they all tied uh, each other together, and also tied into the main story at the end too, which was nice to see. It's nice to see these stories weren't here just for the sake of it, and it all tied into what was going on in the volume. So, due to Accelerator's trial, which is currently going on since he has confessed to murdering 10,000 Misaka clones, he is now revealed to the world that these clones actually exist and are scattered across the world. So, the world is currently debating whether Makoto clones are human or have a right to exist. And then Dion Fortune convinces Accelerator to uh, allow the clones to be used in the attack on Los Angeles. Dion believes this is the best way to get the sisters to have true legitimacy and acceptance in the modern world, while also threatening Accelerator not to do anything bad to Shiage after he was uh, almost killed in the previous volume. And really their conversation was one of the highlights of the volume for me. It was really good and it was great to see Dion giving Accelerator some facts since Accelerator is being a bit too hard on himself. I know he did some terrible things in the past, but the world really needs Accelerator as Anna Sprengel is a massive threat to the world right now. And honestly, it'd be better for Accelerator to be putting his power to be doing some good instead of um, taking a prison sentence or even being sentenced to death. Since Japan still has the death sentence, so 
in the next volume, we could see Accelerator on his way to the gallows. Obviously, Accelerator is not going to die, and hopefully he will actually change his mind once Anna Sprengel's plan does come into actual motion. Meanwhile, Roberto Katze is uh, under pressure over the Operation Overlord Revenge, which is the operation led by Academy City and the Anglican Church to stop um, the RNC occultics in Los Angeles. So he's under pressure for allowing the foreign force to be allowed into America, but he had his reasons for doing so, as it would be probably a bigger controversy if he asked American troops to turn on fellow Americans. He is debating against his political opponents and his vice president, Darius Hulane. Roberto has to discuss the legitimacy of the existence of clones, stating that they have a right to exist like anyone else would have who is human, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, etc. Meanwhile, we do get a scene with Makoto with her phone going crazy since everyone is reacting to the news of the clones existing and her panicking over what Kuroko will think. So I'm excited to see what the connotations are for the clones going public will be in the future volumes. Oh yeah, and we got a bit of Makoto and Shoko this volume, not an awful lot, but a tiny amount, but still, I don't get why. I feel like Kamachi is just shilling them into every volume as of late, like, is this just to satisfy the Railgun fans since, I don't know, Makoto definitely deserved to be in this volume, but Shoko, I'm not quite sure. And I say that as someone who loves Shoko, like she's my favorite girl in the series. But yeah, even in Old Testament, we didn't have Mikoto in every volume. But now I feel like we're getting both of them in nearly every volume that's coming out nowadays. I don't think they were in Genesis Testament 3, but literally every other volume as of late, like the late volumes of New Testament and now the early volumes of Genesis Testament, we're just getting Misaka and Shoko, even if the duo itself doesn't really have anything to do with the actual plot going on in the volume. But I'd like to see that change and give some other characters a spotlight because it's kind of getting crazy now how much Kamachi is shilling this pairing. It is later revealed that Darius, the vice president, is in fact the bad guy, Citrinitas, but he's using a double uh, in Washington, D.C. while he debates with Roberto Katze, while the real Citrinitas is disguised as Melzabeth and that weird doll gimp dog thing, <laughs> which they swap places in order to discredit and shame Melzabeth. Darius wasn't an amazing villain by any stretch, he was quite one-dimensional. He was just jealous that Roberto Katze, like a complete idiot, like <laughs> a crazy-ass American guy who just is pretty honest about his feelings and wasn't very educated, but still became president, climbed above him, and he basically wanted to um, use RNC occultics to bring his ideal version of America and basically assume power for himself. So yeah, pretty one-dimensional politician villain. Uh, not much more needs to be said, but again, Index doesn't really have many one-dimensional villains apart from some of the Kiharas and a few other villains here and there. A lot of them are multi-dimensional characters, so it's not necessarily a bad thing by having a one-dimensional villain for a change. Roberto himself in this volume was more crazy than ever, like Jesus, he had no chill whatsoever, but it was honestly refreshing to see and he was a blast in every scene, although the I feel like the shotgun thing that was going on was a bit too crazy for even me like i was thinking really he just pulled out a shotgun like during a press conference to the world like and is battling with the vice president with shotguns like that was a bit too crazy even for me but i still appreciated it like <laughs> although i found it kind of weird how none of them got shot like they both were just battling these shotguns and none of them got hit even once that was a bit strange to me but yeah, uh, apart from that, like, Roberto was completely batshit crazy. He's definitely a chaotic, good character uh, in terms of his alignment. But yeah, he kind of reminds me of some presidents as of late who are really, like, American in terms of how over the top and audacious they are. But Roberto is a good person at heart, so we'll forgive him. Sadly, the end fight scene wasn't anything special. It wasn't the best fight at all which is a shame, but I feel like the mystery aspect of the volume was definitely the main draw, rather than it being an action-heavy volume. And the Makoto clones did spring into action against a 5-over modelled off Accelerator, 
But I don't think we actually saw that fight, which is disappointing since they, they showed an illustration of it, but we didn't really get a proper scene with them fighting it. It kind of just like went away. Unless I missed it. Did I miss it? You tell me. The ending of this volume though was pretty goddamn good. I mean, I didn't really care much for Melzebeth and Helkalia getting that reunion. Okay, it was satisfying just to see the conclusion of the main plot line, but the juicy stuff happened after that. From this volume, we can definitely feel the political world of Toaru changing uh, as Accelerator receives his sentence. Obviously, we don't know what sentence he's going to get. It's either going to be many, 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 many years behind bars, or he's going to be sentenced to death, as I previously mentioned. So yeah, I'm excited to see what happens with that. But man, the scene, you know what scene I'm going to be fanboying about. The scene with the human or demon Alistair Crowley. Okay, Alistair just went full, no chill, just complete savage in this volume. And oh my god, this guy, or girl, is completely just the goat. That's just the only way to describe Alistair. Alistair effectively storms RNC Occultics HQ and just murders everyone by himself. And once he gets to the room of like the company executives, he fucking tortures them to death. Like he sprays this water gun on them, which puts this uh, fluid on, which attracts these modif genetically modified flies that basically put eggs into your body, that basically eat your body from the inside by turning them into maggots. And while that is going on, he also makes them unable to move by passing this allergen through the air. And he starts to carve away at them with a letter opener as they are completely vulnerable. Like, how brutal can you get? Like, that is fucking zero chill, Alistair. That is, that is definitely probably the most gruesome and disturbing things Alistair has ever done in the series. Because usually... He's doing cruel shit behind the scenes and, you know, being the puppet master. But this time we get to see him actually doing some cruel shit himself. And that was next level. Like, he wanted to send a message to Anna Sprengel. And I think he goddamn did. And at the end of the volume, we finally understand what Anna Sprengel's plan was by having the 30 million people disappear in Los Angeles. It was essentially meant to act as a bait. Because Anna Sprengel wanted RNC Occultics to be destroyed in order to spread unrest and riots throughout the world. So the disappearances was basically forcing the world powers to intervene and force them to take out RNT occultics to get these riots to take place. And it'll be interesting to see what Anna Sprengel will do due to this chaos and civil unrest at big corporations like RNC occultics as a result of what's happened and Anna Sprengel is working in tandem with other Rosicrucian magicians, although we don't know a lot about them. One of them is called uh, Arcadia, I think, and another one is called Alice, but we don't know anything about them yet, so we'll have to wait and see until what happens. But yeah, I think Alistair may have predicted what Anna was doing, that it was just bait, but RNC cultists needed to be dealt with anyway, even if it was bait or whatever, uh, a trap. It still needs to be taken out by someone. So... Yeah, Alistair is basically declaring war on Anna Sprengel at this moment in time. He's basically said, Anna, I'm here. I'm ready to kill you. Let's get onto this. So Alistair seems to be putting his plan into motion. I don't know what Alistair is planning, uh, but we'll have to wait and see. So I'm really fucking hyped to see Anna and Alistair clash. And you bet I'm team Alistair. Alistair, you better not job to this. You better fucking win. If you don't, I'll be disappointed. <laughs> and yeah, I think... Next volume might be an Anna and Alistair volume, but I can also probably see Toma getting involved with Accelerator next volume. But um, that might be later on in the story. We don't know yet, but that's what I'd like to see next volume anyway. But yeah, overall, I'll give this volume a 7 out of 10. I feel like it was a good volume, but there were a few flaws here and there, and there are a few things about the plot that didn't really um, grasp me. But it is a build-up volume, so you got to give it the benefit of the doubt is building up to uh, better events I imagine uh, but what it did do was develop the political world of Toaru so I can't wait to see where it goes in the future thank you for watching this video next I'll be doing a Toaru podcast discussing this volume in more detail with 
three or four others. So stay tuned for that on the channel. And yeah, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time. Bye bye.